Our next speaker came to us from UK. His area of interest is cloud migration and cloud native solutions. He's a successful speaker on multiple conferences. He's a Microsoft MVP and an expert in Azure and in Kubernetes. Please welcome on stage Mr. Shahid Iqbal. Thank you. Hello, everyone. I'm just going to start my timer. My name is Shahid Iqbal, and uh, I'm a freelance consultant working in .NET, kind of Azure Kubernetes projects. Um, you've heard the intro, so let's skip most of this. Um, main reason for this slide is my contact details. So um, if we don't get a chance to get to questions today, I'll be around for the rest of the day. Feel free to get in touch with me. Twitter's probably the best place. Um, happy to answer any questions. So what are we going to cover today? Really, this talk is about Kubernetes. So it's be you know, an introduction to Kubernetes. We'll talk about how we create clusters, how we deploy applications. There'll be some demos along the way. And we'll talk about managed Kubernetes providers. And we'll talk about hybrid clusters later. So the key takeaways from this talk are really just give you a good grasp of the basics of Kubernetes, the key concepts, the key architecture. Um, give you the confidence to go away and start playing around with Kubernetes yourselves. I'm not going to talk about Docker and how we create containers. And in the same vein, this is a reasonably introductory Kubernetes talk. So how many people are kind of working with containers at the moment? OK. So Kubernetes, anyone using Kubernetes? OK. You could probably come and give this talk then. Um, so there may not be a huge amount new for, for people who are quite familiar with Kubernetes. Feel free to grab a coffee. For the rest of us, let's crack on. There's going to be quite a lot of content to squeeze into 55 minutes. So I apologize if I go quite quickly. So Kubernetes is an open source container orchestration platform. It was originally created by Google based on a couple of their open source projects, or so a couple of the internal projects called, one called Borg and one called Omega. It's written in Go and it's completely open source. And actually it's not owned by Google anymore. So they donated it to the Cloud Native Computing Foundation, which is a subset of the Linux Foundation. And this is one of the key reasons why Kubernetes, in my opinion, has taken, you know, seen such an uptick in, in kind of adoption. Because it's not owned by Google, it means other big tech companies have been able to contribute to the project and evolve it very rapidly. Before we go too much further, you often see Kubernetes kind of abbreviated to K8s or Kates. You might be wondering what that, what that means. It's basically just K, there's eight letters till we get to the S. That's all that is. Um, so why do I need something like Kubernetes? We're, most of us here, I presume, are .NET developers or work with .NET. Up until a few years ago, we used to deploying applications to either VMs or physical machines. Because we use the .NET framework, that's part of the OS. So if we deploy a different application, we want some isolation, we probably want to put it in a separate machine. So we do that, and that's fine. The problem is we're paying for separate Windows licenses for each one of these VMs. Each one of these VMs probably isn't making best use of the resources available, we're probably having to over-provision for peak load. Now we come to the kind of a slightly newer world of containers. So containers give us this isolation. So what we can do now is we can deploy multiple applications onto a single machine. We're now getting more density. We're using fewer machines, paying fewer Windows licenses, which is awesome. What happens if one of these machines dies? Firstly, we're going to need to know the machine's died. Hopefully, we have alerting monitoring in place to do that. Oops, sorry, too far. Um, then we're going to have to figure out what was on that machine. We have to go in and spin up another machine and replace what was running on that machine. This is where container orchestration kind of comes in. So what container orchestration does, takes a bunch of machines and essentially meshes them together. So we have a blob of compute, memory, and networking. We put a kind of container orchestrator like Kubernetes across that. And then we deploy our containers onto this container orchestration platform. The nice thing is, 
Now, uh, certainly as a developer, those underlying machines, they're not so important to me anymore. I don't care about them too much. If at 3 o'clock in the morning one of those machines dies, I won't get paged. It's not my problem. In fact, the cluster operators probably won't be notified either because Kubernetes will detect there's some containers that should have been running, but they're not, and we'll find somewhere else to run them. So where can I run Kubernetes? The short answer is actually anywhere. So on-premise, you can install it on bare metal. More commonly, you're going to have some kind of infrastructure as a service or private cloud, VMware, OpenStack, etc. You can even put Kubernetes onto Raspberry Pis. Some of you may have seen these really cool demos with a stack of Raspberry Pis running a cluster. It's pretty cool. Another option, quite a popular one, is to create infrastructure in the cloud and then install Kubernetes on there. And this is where actually the majority of Kubernetes installations are currently being used. And then the more recent addition to these kind of options, are these managed Kubernetes providers. Uh, pretty much every technology company out there has some kind of offering. I'm only really going to mention the main cloud providers. I'll talk a little bit more about this in detail later. But essentially, managed Kubernetes providers make running Kubernetes easier and therefore makes it more accessible to smaller teams, teams that don't have the expertise of running big, complex clusters. What about cost? Well, at the start, I said Kubernetes was free and open source. And that's awesome. Except for some companies, particularly bigger ones, they need some kind of support. They need some kind of commercial support. They need somebody to shout out if things go wrong. So with that in mind, we have a couple of options. There's actually quite a lot. I'll only mention two. So if you've got OpenShift from Red Hat, and OpenShift is, is not actually what we call upstream Kubernetes. They've taken Kubernetes and they've added bits and pieces to it. I often describe it as if Kubernetes was Android, then OpenShift is Samsung's version of Android. They've taken Android, they've added bits on top of it. Docker have Docker Enterprise, which essentially supports you running Kubernetes and also supports you migrating from Docker Swarm over to Kubernetes. Another option for support is to go down the route of consulting companies. So Heptio is probably the most well-known of these. It was created by some of the founders of the Kubernetes project. Um, in the UK, there's a couple of other companies, Jetstack and WeWorks. I don't actually know what the situation in Poland is, but I'm sure somebody can tell me afterwards. Now, if you follow the kind of this landscape, you know, recent, uh, certainly in the past year, there's been a number of acquisitions. So, IBM acquired Red Hat, and uh, VMware acquired Heptio. So these other big technology companies are really making a move into this space as well, along with offering their own Kubernetes services. So Kubernetes has a number of features. You saw a quick demo of a container orchestration. It allows you to horizontally and vertically scale your applications and actually scale your cluster as well. It has kind of service discovery load balancing. It lets you do self-healing and numerous other features. I, I, I'll demo some of these later, but there, there's many features on there. Um, one of the things that's actually quite interesting is when we talk about containers, we often think about web services running, long running processes. But containers are quite good for doing batch processing. A container spins up, does a piece of work, shuts down again and Kubernetes can run those as well. In order to provide those kind of features, Kubernetes has a number of components. That's just a, a subset. Now, I'm not going to talk through that list. I think the key takeaway from this slide is Kubernetes is a big, complex project. But actually, as I'll hopefully show you, to get started, you don't need to know all of these things from the start. As you start working with Kubernetes, you'll find you'll need to do some more specific things there's a very good chance the capability is actually built into Kubernetes already. And if it isn't, there's a very good chance there's a project out there that's doing that thing. And if you're running into a problem that no one else is doing, then either you're doing something unique or you're doing something wrong, frankly. So let's dive a little bit into the architecture. So a high level, Kubernetes is, a, is like many distributed systems. It's comprised of kind of control plane and a data plane. The control plane is um, essentially a highly available number of nodes, exposes an API. 
and you talk to Kubernetes through that API. And then we have the data plane, so what's called the worker nodes, where we actually run our containers. And if you notice, the, the um, control plane is Linux only, whereas the worker nodes are Linux or Windows. And every other time I've given this talk, I've now caveated it by saying, Windows supports in beta. Not anymore. So as of Monday, Windows nodes are now GA in Kubernetes. So in Kubernetes 1.14, which came out Monday the 25th, Windows, supports, Windows nodes are now supported. Dive a little bit deeper into this uh, control plane. And incidentally, you'll hear the term master nodes, worker nodes. The community is trying to get away from the term master. It has a negative connotation. So apologies if I slip into mentioning it. It takes a while to kind of ease yourself out of that thinking. So on the, um, on the master node, there we are, did it straight away. On the control plane node, we have the API server. And as I mentioned, the API server is where you communicate to Kubernetes. You typically can use the UI or the command line tool, which I call kubectl, also called kubecontrol, kubecuddle, kubecuddle, kubecontrol. Most of you developers are probably bored of arguing about tabs versus spaces. This is the new tabs versus spaces in Kubernetes world. We argue about how we pronounce things. If you're ever going to release an open source project in this space, please define the, the pronunciation from the start so we stop arguing. Alongside this, the API server, we have the scheduler. The scheduler's job is basically to figure out where to run my containers. We can do some clever things with the scheduler. We can give it hints about what, where it should run containers. We have the controller manager. This is basically just the main control loop in a, in a Kubernetes cluster. Its job is to monitor the nodes, make sure the nodes are up. And we have the cloud controller manager. This is a component, as the name suggests, it was actually taken out from the main controller manager. And it kind of recognizes that when you run Kubernetes on the cloud, you have to interact with the cloud provider. So you have to provision public IP addresses, you have to provision load balances. So that's what that component does. All of the configuration within a Kubernetes cluster is stored in etcd, which is a distributed key value data store. If you're running Kubernetes yourself, that's the key bit of this. That's the brains. So you have to ensure that the master nodes, control plane nodes, are highly available, and the etcd database is backed up and restorable, recoverable. Let's dive a little bit deeper into the worker nodes. So the worker nodes have this kubelet. That's like the main agent that runs on on a node. We have the kube proxy. That just deals with the networking. Then we have this container runtime. So I asked about containers, and most people think of Docker when we talk about containers. Kubernetes doesn't take a hard dependency on Docker. It abstracts the, the container interface to use a container runtime interface. And that means you can swap out the container runtime if you want to. A rocket is another example of a container runtime you can use. We have a couple of supporting services that do metrics and health checking. Then we have these pods. The pods are actually where your containers run. So Kubernetes doesn't deploy naked containers, if you like. It wraps them in a construct called a pod. A pod can have one or more containers within it. And when it does, uh, they, those containers will be sharing resources, and they can talk to each other over localhost. The key thing to remember with a pod is it's the unit of scale and the unit of deployment. So if things shouldn't be scaled together, then they shouldn't be in the same pod. So a database and the web app shouldn't be in the same pod because you wouldn't scale those at the same time. Incidentally, when you have this kind of multiple containers within a pod, you often call the secondary containers sidecar containers, just in case you hear that term mentioned. So if I want to work with Kubernetes, do I need to have access to the cloud all the time? Do I need to have access to some kind of on-premise data center? And the answer is no. There's a couple of projects that let you work with Kubernetes locally on a, on a dev machine. So Minikube is one of the Kubernetes sub-projects. Um, it allows you to run Kubernetes clusters on, I think, all of the operating systems. And then more recently, Docker added support for Kubernetes as part of their Docker for desktop. In both cases, essentially what they do is they create a single node cluster using some kind of virtualization technology, so typically Hyper-V on Windows. 
the key thing is you interact with it using the same tools as you would interact with another Kubernetes cluster. You just don't get the semantics of multiple nodes and nodes failing. So let's take a quick look at deploying some applications. This is where I type in front of 500 people. My typing's pretty bad as it is, but um, we'll see. So I think I need... Cool. So you can get, let's just maximize that. So very quickly, Docker for desktop, you get Windows and Mac options. If you're on Windows, I would use Chocolatey. People use Chocolatey? Yeah, awesome tool, it just makes life so much easier. So, what I've done is I've installed that. I'm using Commander, if you're not familiar with the command line interface, it's basically DOS and Linux kind of command lines mixed together. Can everyone see that at the back okay? Take that as a yes. So I talked about we argue what we call kubectl, cube control. I've aliased it to k on my machine, so we won't argue about it. Every time you see me type k, that's cube control. So what I can do is I can do cube control from cluster info, and I get some information. Oops. Just tells me this Kubernetes master running on local host. If I do k get nodes, tells me I've got a single node, it's a master. Kubernetes, typically you don't run workloads on the master nodes. Um, when it's a single node, you don't have a choice. So what I can do is I can run an application. So the quickest way to do that is if I do kubectl run, I'll give it a name, so I'll call it hello world. I specify the container image. So I've got this image up on Docker Hub. And I will tell it, I want to expose it the container port, port 80. That tells me a deployment's been created. So now if I do okay, get pods, you'll see, as quick as that, that pod is running. Now, slight smoke and mirrors, because I've done this before on this machine, so the container image has been pulled and cached locally. But once you have the container image, the key difference with containers is they start much, much quicker than VMs. So I've got that, now if I want to Going to take a look at it. This is an ASP.NET Core web app running in a Linux container. So what I can do is I can expose that uh, deployment. So I've called the deployment hello world. I told you I can't type in front of people. I'm going to expose that on port 80, and I'm going to use this type equals load balancer. And I'll explain what that means um, when I come back to the slides. So now I do okay, get service. And I can see I've got this Hello World service. I'll just move that up a little bit. Running a local host port 80. So if I come over and I open tab, I'll just go to local host. If I can type local host. We see my application. Now, let's just make that a bit bigger. Now, if you look really closely, you'll spot why I don't call myself a full-stack engineer anymore. I'm definitely a back-end engineer. This is a uh, web app, and I'll just call this bit out. So in the Razor, I've highlighted, I've, I've basically referenced environment.machine name. And what you'll notice is that's actually the name of the container. That's the name of the pod, rather. Oops, let's do that again. OK, so I've got this application running. What if I want to scale it? So I can scale it manually, so I can do kubectl scale. I want to scale the deployment called hello world. Still can't type, hello world. And I want the replicas, oops, replicas to be five. Now if I do kget pods, if I'm quick enough, we'll see the pods being created. I'll just do that again, we'll see we're up and running. So that's how quickly it was to scale up to five instances. If I come back to the UI, if I refresh this, we may see the load balancing. So Kubernetes is actually load balancing this traffic across those five instances automatically for us. Now, because this is a lightweight application, it's actually just pinned, it seems, to the same node. But that's always a good opportunity to show you one other quick feature while I'm here. So Kubernetes has a really strong concept of desired state. You tell Kubernetes what state you want your application to be in, 
and it will monitor it and it will try and maintain that state. If something happens that changes that state, like some idiot deleting a pod, then Kubernetes will detect that. And if you notice, there's five pods running, the one terminating, that's the one I just killed. So within the time it took me to type the command, Kubernetes had detected that there should have been five instances, there were only four, and it spun up another one. So if I just run that again, you should see now we're back to, and you can see the new one is 18 seconds. So that just gives you a quick, quick flavor of how quick it is to get started deploying an application to Kubernetes. So let's come back to the slides. So you saw me typing in the command line, and we all know that's not really the way we should do things when we're talking about this, particularly deploying to production. So Kubernetes has this concept of manifest files. So essentially, these files can be YAML or JSON, although most people tend to use YAML. They define the application structure and the resources the application needs. Critically, they define the desired state of the application. So the way I like to think about it is, your application is actually a container. And as far as Kubernetes is concerned, it doesn't care what's inside the container. That's the beauty of containers. Everything is inside the container. We don't care what's in there. These manifest files are then our kind of infrastructure configuration as code. So these things should be in source control, and so you should manage them. So let's take a look at one of these. Don't know how easy that is to see, but this is a manifest file for the deployment I just did. Now it's quite hard for me to see the screen, but I think, let's see. No, it's not so good. I can try this, but I think it'll be a bit wonky. So we can see up here somewhere, <laughs> it says the resource kind, uh, and then it's got some labels. So these are just key value pairs. They're, they're kind of relevant and will come later. And then further down, I'll stop doing that because I can't really see what it's doing. Further down towards the bottom, we can see we've got the spec, we've got the container image, we've got the, the version, uh, we've got the name, and we've got the container port. Now if I want to deploy this, what I can do is I do keep control, apply, dash F, and I pass it the YAML file. This command is obviously automatable, so it makes life a lot easier. So when you're looking at this YAML file, and you're thinking, that's a lot harder than typing kubectl run. And I totally agree. So what people often do is they'll go and find an existing example, or they'll take the docs, and they'll copy the YAML out of it. If you know anything about YAML, you know it's very sensitive to spaces, and you can lose a lot of time with one misplaced space in YAML. So a nice trick is you can actually get the Kubernetes to generate the manifest file for you. So what you do is you run the same command I ran before, except this time we append dash dash dry dash run at the end of it. And what Kubernetes will do is basically validate that deployment, it will generate the manifest. We can just then tell it to output in YAML, and we pipe that to a YAML file. That's what I did for that file there. There's a couple of extra timestamps in there you can delete, but that's the best way of generating the file. So once I've deployed my kind of containers, how do I access them? You imagine you've got multiple containers for your application, multiple instances. So in order to access your applications, Kubernetes uses a service. A service is essentially a well-defined endpoint that you can use to load balance traffic to the underlying instances. Kubernetes uses DNS internally, so you just use a DNS address. So key thing here is, if a node dies in Kubernetes, Kubernetes will detect that. It will figure out there should be a container running. It will run it somewhere else. If I was accessing that specific container sp directly, my application would stop working. But with the load balancer and the service, it just carries on working. There's no issues. When I look at deploying a service, the service YAML, YAML is a lot easier, a lot simpler. So at the top there, you can see it's the resource kind service. And then we see we're expecting traffic on port 80. We're going to forward it to port 80. And then the bit where the arrow comes out, that's the selector, the label selector. And this is a key component, or a key way that Kubernetes kind of links resources together. So the service is loosely coupled from the underlying pods. And the label selector essentially is like a predicate. It's like a where clause. It says, find me all the pods that have this particular label. 
The nice thing with that is pods can move around, they can do different nodes, more or fewer can be spun up. As long as they have that label, the Kubernetes will, that service will essentially find them and load balance the traffic across them. And then that type is load balancer. So like I said, I'll come back to this. So services, there are multiple types of services in Kubernetes. You've seen me mention load balancer. Essentially, this says expose this service publicly. Now, publicly depends on where you're running Kubernetes. In the cloud, this is actually what that cloud controller manager is doing. It's going to talk to, say, Azure and tell Azure, provision me a load balancer and assign a public IP address. The default option is cluster IP. It'll get an IP address internal to the cluster. It won't be accessible externally. Node port will create a port on each of the nodes in your cluster, and any traffic arriving there will be routed to your application. And then the final one, it's not used a huge amount, is external name. This essentially maps some external service into the DNS in, within Kubernetes, so that your application thinks it's talking to another service that perhaps is in Kubernetes, but actually it's not. So we talked about this load balancer service, and if I've got one application, then that's fine. What if I've got 100? Do I make all of them a load balancer? Do I have 100 public IP addresses, 100 entry points into my cluster? This is where we can look at things like ingress. So ingress essentially creates a single entry point into your cluster, a single public IP address, and then the traffic is routed to the underlying applications based on rules that you specify. The ingress allows you to have a single termination point for SSL certificates, and it may be preferable to go down the ingress route than having multiple public um, load balancer services. The, one of the issues with ingress is it's pretty basic. It, it doesn't let you do a huge amount. It doesn't let you control the traffic or the traffic weighting. And this is where service meshes, which is another very hot topic, are really gaining traction because they let you do a lot more control over the traffic. Let's take a look at how hostname routing can work with ingress. So I've got two services, two applications deployed, and I'm using, I'm binding kind of app one subdomain, um, and I've set up some rules. So when traffic comes into app one, it will come through and it'll get routed. Let's just go back a second. The ingress controller will see the rules and it will basically route the traffic to the, um, to the app one. Similarly, if I then go to app two, the host headers will come through and Kubernetes will propagate that traffic to app two. You can do this on path-based as well, and I'll show you an example later. Very briefly, if you're curious what the YAML looks like for this, it's actually quite straightforward. So we've got resource kind ingress, and then we've got the rules. So we say app one, send it to the service called app one on port 80. Hopefully you'll agree that's actually re reasonably readable. So, so far, I've talked about three different kind of manifest files, and there's actually a load more. We can have volumes, we can have secrets, we can have config maps. What if I've got, well, I should have multiple clusters. I'll have dev cluster, QA cluster, production cluster. How do I manage all of these manifest files? So one option is using something called Helm. So Helm is a package manager for Kubernetes. Now, as developers, we hear the term package manager. And we think NuGet, and we think NPM. This is, and this is application package. So think of apt-get chocolatey. So essentially, it allows us to parameterize our manifest files and then specify values depending on the environment, for example. Everything in Kubernetes is a nautical theme. So Helm packages are called charts. And there's a public repository of popular kind of open source projects that you can use, like MongoDB, Redis, things like that, where you don't need to have any of the manifest files yourselves. You can just use Helm to install it. Now, the lack of time, otherwise, I'd go through a bit more detail on how you use Helm. But essentially, this is one option for packaging your own applications. You create Helm charts. So we've spent about 30 minutes or so talking about kind of Kubernetes concepts. I want to spend the next few minutes going through some of the features. So the first one is 
health checking. I talked about self-healing when I talked about features. So Kubernetes allows you to define endpoints within your application that you can poll to determine the health of your application. So you've got a number of options here depending on, you can have a HTTP call, you can have a, just a, a script that runs that executes inside the container. With HTTP, Kubernetes is looking at the status code. The status code comes back between 2 and 400. It deems the application to be healthy. Anything else, it says the application is not healthy. If that endpoint reports it's not healthy, then Kubernetes will restart the container. In a similar vein, we have readiness checking. So readiness checking says to Kubernetes that my application is healthy, don't kill it, but it's not ready to receive traffic just yet. When the readiness endpoint says it's not ready, Kubernetes just won't send it any traffic, and then as soon as it says it's ready, it will start sending traffic. These two features are really key when you're doing the third thing, which is rolling deployments. So Kubernetes allows you to do zero downtime rolling updates. This is a thing that everyone wants to, wants to do. It's a really cool thing. It's worth mentioning that just because you can do it in Kubernetes doesn't mean you should do it in your applications. You've really got to question whether zero downtime is necessary for your particular use case. The key thing is there's real challenges around ensuring your data model and your schema are compatible going forwards and backwards for rolling updates to work properly. Kubernetes can't solve that problem for you. We do blue-green deployments, and we can even roll back. To do the rolling deployments, Kubernetes uses two key parameters. This slide will be a little bit confusing, but hopefully as we get on to the visualizations, it will explain it a bit better. So we have these two, two kind of parameters. One is uh, max unavailable. This tells Kubernetes how many of the existing pods do I take offline while I'm doing an update? So where that's important is you might have a, a service that's under heavy load. You may have five instances of it running, and you can afford to lose one maybe, any more than that you start affecting your traffic. So you can tell Kubernetes, don't take off more than one as you upgrade. On the flip side, we have max surge. This tells Kubernetes how many new pods to create as part of the deployment, and the reason you might limit this number is you may not have capacity in your cluster to have twice as many pods running as you would on a normal, normal day. These numbers can be percentages or actual numbers of pods. As I said, it's a little bit confusing when you try and explain it verbally, so hopefully the next few slides will explain it in a, in a bit more kind of clearer manner. So I've got this deployment. Uh, I've set max unavailable to zero, so I've said I'm not... I can't afford to lose any pods when I do the update, but I'm allowed to surge by one. So when I start the deployment, Kubernetes will create one new pod. It'll wait for it to be healthy and ready. It's really important you specify those endpoints. And then it will switch the traffic over. If you notice, we surged up to four pods there. It'll take one of the existing pods out of the load balancer. So we're now back to serving traffic with three pods. It will give the, the pod is just taken out 30 seconds by default to finish what it's doing, and then it will kill it. So we're now back down to three pods. The key thing is, you notice, we've got V1 and V2 pods serving traffic at the same time. So your data model has to support this. The process rolls on, we surge up to four, we drop back down to three, and eventually, you notice at no point are less than three pods serving traffic, so we shouldn't be losing any traffic at this point. We're never down. And eventually, we've rolled all the way over to V2. So, so my animations are working or not? Not quite. Similarly, with blue-green deployments, what we do now is we say max unavailable of zero, but max surge of 100%. So no surprises, really. 100% of the new pods are created. Wait for them to be healthy and ready. Then we switch the traffic over to the new pods. The old pods get a chance to finish what they're doing, 
and they die. Yeah, it sounded quite gruesome, didn't it? Uh, so that was... That was a few minutes kind of talking about some of the key features. I'd love to spend probably the whole day talking about all the other features. But uh, people have to go home at some point. Um, I want to talk a bit more about these managed Kubernetes providers. I mentioned them at the start. And as I said, I, I used to work with a lot of you know, small dev team. We didn't have an ops team. We didn't have a platform team. Managed Kubernetes providers essentially take care of running that master, that control plane for you. This takes away one of the biggest complexities of running Kubernetes, um, and it makes it accessible then to smaller teams. As I said, the main three cloud providers have this offering. Um, in the case of AKS and Google, they don't charge for those control plane nodes. Um, Amazon does at the moment. So in the case of Azure, running AKS costs you exactly the same as running normal VMs. You don't pay anything extra for running AKS over on top of your standard infrastructure charges. Dive a little bit more into AKS specifically. It's the one I know the most. I mentioned those management nodes. We don't, we don't have access to them. We don't even see them. That's good and bad, because we don't have to manage them. We don't have to worry about them. We don't pay for them. But it also means we can't control some of the configuration. We can't pass in startup parameters, feature flags, but that's normally the trade-off you have with managed services. We can run multiple different versions of Kubernetes on AKS. You can have multiple different clusters all running different versions. We can integrate uh, AKS clusters into existing VNets, which is obviously quite important when you're managing your infrastructure. And quite nice, you can also integrate Azure AD into your, your roles-based access control within Kubernetes. So anyone who's using Office 365 is going to have Azure AD. So this is really nice. That feature's in preview at the moment. We also have the cluster autoscaler. This is a reasonably new addition, and it's in preview, but it allows you to automatically scale the number of nodes in the cluster depending on certain metrics. The key one being there's not enough, the containers are waiting to run, there's not enough resources. Nodes are automatically patched in, in AKS, certainly Linux nodes. So you don't need to worry about the kind of operating system level concerns. The nodes are not automatically restarted for you, though. But there's an open source project out there which will actually detect when a node has been patched and restart it for you in a Kubernetes safe way. And finally, uh, Windows nodes. I mentioned Windows nodes, kind of GA on Monday. So there's a private preview at the moment on AKS for having node pools made of Windows Server, not publicly available at the moment. But to create an AKS cluster, it's actually really straightforward from the command line. So the first line is basically creating a resource group. It's standard what you do in Azure for everything. To create the cluster, it's just az aks create dash n, the name of the cluster, dash g, the resource group name. Now, you can just do that, or you can specify additional parameters, like dash k will give you the specific, you can put a specific Kubernetes version. Dash c gives you the number of nodes you want, so three by default. And there's actually a ton of other options you can have in there. It, that kind of makes up for some of the lacking of not controlling the, the control plane nodes for you. So let's have a look at how we do this in AKS. So what I'm gonna do is, so I was just using kube control on my local Docker cluster. Really nice thing is it's just very easy to switch to using a remote cluster. So that command there, config use context, is now switched to using AKS cluster. Because this is Kubernetes, it could be any cluster anywhere. So now if I do k cluster info, we'll see some different information. The, the, the information there's not that relevant. This cluster's running in UK South. So if this demo goes horribly wrong, we can blame Brexit, I think. Um, so if I now do kget nodes, you can see I've got three nodes. And notice how they're all agent nodes. 
no control plane, no master nodes visible. Now, to save a few seconds, I've already deployed the application. So, quickly show you the same get pods. Should see single instance running. Just scroll that up a bit. If I do kget service, you can see now it's got an external IP address. So, this is that cloud controller manager talking to Azure, telling it to provision an IP address. Now, before I pop that open, you've seen the application already. I wanted to show you the YAML file because I've added a couple of things to it. So I've added that strategy for rolling updates. So max search of one, max unavailable of one, and min ready. Three seconds, oops. The bit I wanted to show you was the health checking. So down here, you can see I've specified a probe. It's going to hit slash home slash health in my application on port 80. It's going to wait three seconds, and then it's going to poll it every three seconds. So let's come over and just open a new tab. And initially, we're seeing the same thing we saw before. So now if I want to scale the application, I could do the imperative command of the command line. But if I'm being good, I should come up here. I should set replicas to five, save that file. And now do, oops, don't do that. Five, let's come back to here. And now I do, OK, apply dash F. Deployment of YAML. And now do K get pods. We should see the same thing we saw before we scaled up. And that's great. So let's come back to the UI. So I showed you that endpoint I specified. So slash home slash health. And you can see it's just, it's just sending back a, a OK 200. Uh, I've put a text message on there, but that doesn't really matter. So in my applications, I never have any bugs. Um, they're just features that I haven't documented. So to demo the next bit, I've done something truly horrendous. So I've set an endpoint which actually basically kills my application. Um, not only that, I've modified the state of my application from a GET request. So that's like double evil. So you definitely don't do that. If I come back to the uh, command line, if I do GET pods now, you'll see, actually, so I've already run this before, you see the... Um, Restart count's gone up. It was one, it's now two. It was one because I tried this earlier. Okay, the final demo I want to show you is the rolling deployments, and I think that works better as a video, so I'm just going to switch to a video. Hopefully this is reasonably clear. So I've got two panes here. I've got the, the right-hand side. I'm doing a curl command to the public IP address, and I'm pulling down the H1 tag. I'll put that in a batch file because old school windows, and I'm going to loop through that, just printing that H1 tag. And then on the right-hand side, I'm going to edit the deployment file, and we're going, to, we're going to start our deployment. We're going to change the version of the application. So I come down, change the image version to V2. And then I'm going to do an apply. And just before I start the apply, what I'll do is I'll set that batch file going. And we'll see it looping over, and we should see V1 kind of showing. So now I start the deployment. And what I can do is I can look at the status of any deployment by just saying rollout status and then the name. And you can see it's updating at the moment. And if you look over there, you'll see so we've got v, V2 starting to appear in that list. Got V1, V2, V1, V2. Again, hopefully reiterating the point. Rolling deployments will expose more than one version of the application. Eventually, that rollout finishes, and we're only seeing v2. That's fine. So what we can do now is we can have a look at the st status of any deployment by doing cube control rollout history, give it the name of the deployment, and we can see there's two versions. If I had multiple versions, I can go back to a specific version Obviously, a common thing is you may, you may have just done a deployment, you've realized something's gone wrong, and you want to roll back. So we set this back up, so I'll get that batch file going again. I just do kubectl rollout, undo, and then I give it the name of the deployment. So you see it's v2. We start the undo.
can look at the status again. It does a rollout. And then you can see, we're starting to see V1 appearing now on the right-hand side. And eventually, as that finishes rolling out, we'll only see V1. There we are. So it's finished now, so we're only seeing V1. So hopefully that gives you an idea of how the rolling deployments work. So that was the last demo. Let's go back to the slides. We've got about 10 minutes to wrap up. So far, I've talked predominantly about Kubernetes, a little bit about Azure. I haven't really talked about the .NET side. And I suppose, by extension, what's Microsoft's involvement in Kubernetes? Microsoft actually contributes actively to the Kubernetes project, the open source project. Um, I think when they went GA last year, there was about 70 individual contributors to the Kubernetes project from Microsoft. They acquired a company called Deus about two years ago now. Um, and Deus were very big in the Kubernetes space. And that essentially bolts the in-house expertise, the Kubernetes expertise within Microsoft. Brendan Burns, who's actually one of the co-founders of the Kubernetes project, works at Microsoft. He's a distinguished engineer. He still answers Twitter support emails when you have problems with AKS. Send, send him a tweet and he'll probably respond or send you to somebody else. It's awesome. As a .NET developer, I think Microsoft you know, provide a number of tools which make deployments and things easier. And this is one area that I think we're going to see a lot more evolution. So we already have some open source tools from Microsoft, one called Draft, another one called Brigade. Helm was actually created by the Deus team, so essentially Microsoft product. And then there's another project called Azure Dev Spaces, which is really cool. I wish I had time to show you. Um, but again, all of this kind of helps working with Kubernetes, particularly from the tooling we're used to using, much easier. So why am I excited about Kubernetes? As I said, I'm a .NET developer, and I see Kubernetes as essentially a single platform for all of our .NET applications. So we can create hybrid clusters with Linux and Windows nodes, and we can deploy our legacy, sorry, sorry if people are still using full .NET framework, legacy full .NET framework applications, and newer .NET Core on Linux applications to the same platform. So we have a single CI CD pipeline, we have a single management approach. It also makes migrating applications, you know, we, we don't usually stop writing something and start writing a brand new application in, in a new language. We tend to evolve our applications. And when we do that, one of the challenges that we have is, well, we've got win Windows boxes, we've got Linux boxes, and we need to, you know, one service needs to talk to another service. How do we set up the networking? How do we set up the rules and the routing? Well, in Kubernetes, that just works. It's not a problem. We don't need to worry about it. So when I talk about single CI CD, what I'm saying is essentially we have .NET Core applications. They go through our build pipeline. We create Linux containers. We deploy them to the Linux nodes within our hybrid cluster. Incidentally, you don't need to have hybrid cluster. Some people talk about having separate clusters for Windows and Linux. It makes the networking a little bit harder, but it's possible or will be possible. Full .NET Framework, this time what we'll do is we'll go through a pipeline, we'll generate a Windows container, and we'll deploy that to the Windows nodes within a cluster. I mentioned this kind of unified platform for evolving applications. So for example, let's say I've got a monolith and I've got it deployed on some Windows boxes inside a Kubernetes cluster. Um, so we're accessing that through myapp.com or whatever. And then I create a microservice. I break out one of the components. And say slash orders becomes a new service that I deploy to Kubernetes. I'm using .NET Core. It's on Linux. Now when a user goes to slash orders, that ingress controller, using path-based routing, can send them to my new service. They go back to the root domain. They come back to my existing service. If my old service and my new service need to talk to each other, they just do that over DNS. They just make a DNS query and do standard HTTP calls. So what's the state of hybrid clusters at the moment? As I said, Windows nodes are in private preview and AKS. Expect an announcement soon 
when they open that up to public preview. I don't know what the plans are for the other cloud providers, but you fully expect them to have similar offerings. If you want to create hybrid clusters right now, one option is to use this open source project called AKS Engine, which allows you to create a fully um, a cluster that you would have to manage entirely yourself, but it's actually what AK, AKS uses behind the scenes to create AKS services as well. So just starting to wrap up, if you've you know, been listening to everything I've said, this looks really cool, what are my kind of parting words of advice? Firstly, don't get sucked in to the Kubernetes hype. Um, I know I've come over from the UK, I've spent the best part of an hour telling you how cool Kubernetes is. But I'm really passionate about ensuring that people are using the right technology for the right problem. I'm a consultant, I see many companies, it'd be very easy for me to tell every single one of them to use Kubernetes. But that's not how it should work. If you've got technical debt and you're drowning in it, adding Kubernetes is not going to make that any easier. If you've got teams that can't work together and are fighting and arguing all the time, and you've got dev team and ops team, and you're chucking things over the fence, adding Kubernetes in the mix probably won't help things. So focus on the basics. Look at 12-factor style applications. Make sure your logging is correct, health checks, readiness checks. These things are actually straightforward. You can start doing them right now. You don't need to do anything else. Have a clear plan for your architecture. You know, where, what, where are you going? What, what's your evolution going to look like? Where you can, start migrating things to .NET Core. .NET Core is the future. .NET Framework is not going anywhere. VB6 is still supported, and it will be forever. So .NET Core will be supported forever. But it's obvious that if you want new features, then chances are it's going to be .NET Core only. So where you're working on things, migrate them to .NET Core. Focus on CI CD pipelines. Right click publish on AKS is just as bad an idea as it is to app service or somewhere else. Where you've got legacy applications or full .NET framework applications that maybe you're not maintaining, you're, not, you're just running them, you don't, you don't do anything with them anymore. You might not even have the source code anymore. It's actually possible to containerize a lot of full .NET framework applications into Windows containers and then put them through this same mechanism. Really important is cluster security and container security. Do not skim over this. This is really important. There's been a spate of crypto mining on Kubernetes clusters, uh, typically because people have exposed their dashboards to the, to the internet. Companies like Tesla have fallen victim to this. Tesla has a lot of engineers and they made a mistake, so really, really important. And again, that's probably a talk in itself. And finally, GitOps is, a, is an interesting concept. It's worth having a look at if you've not seen it before. But essentially, what we see is clusters should be disposable. You shouldn't have snowflake clusters. You should be able to delete your cluster, spin up a new one, everything still works. Well, actually, spin up the new one, then delete the old one. Don't do it that way around, just in case. Um, so, spent a lot of time talking about Kubernetes. What are the alternatives? Docker Swarm, Mesos have DCOS, and Service Fabric can run containers. And when I first started giving this talk, you know, it was worth discussing the alternatives. In reality now, Kubernetes has kind of eaten everything. It's the only real choice now. So just quickly to summarize, Kubernetes is a mature, feature-rich container orchestration platform. Many big companies are betting their future on it. The Windows support for .NET developers is getting better and better. As I said, we've just had the GA of Windows nodes. And Microsoft is clearly invested in it. And there'll be more and more tooling coming. If you want to learn more, Kubernetes docs are pretty good. That book is pretty good. But the top link is my favorite. People here familiar with Katakoda? Not too many hands, this is awesome. So most of us have corporate laptops. We have security, that means we can't install things. As long as you've got an internet connection and a web browser, you can go and learn all about Kubernetes and all of the other cloud native technologies. Um, OpenShift, Istio, um, Jaeger, Tracing, Envoy Proxy, pretty much anything. It's free. I know the person who runs it, he's awesome. And it's a fantastic resource. I learned most of what I learned about Kubernetes using Katacoda. Highly recommend it. And with that, 
I'll say thank you very much. And these slides are available at that link. Thank you very much, Akit. Thank you for being here with us. Thank you for your <laughs> thank presentation. You so much. Thank you. This is a small gift for us, from us to you. Thank, thank you very you, thank much. Thank you very much.